Hello, this is Graham. In this video, I want to spell out the absolute basics of the person-centered approach and the philosophy of life on which it rests. See this as a summary. You will, I expect, want to dig a bit deeper into some of the aspects. Firstly, a reminder. The basic listening skills are reasonably generic. They're used in most talking therapies. However, the context in which they are used as part of a psychoanalytic, existential, transpersonal, integrative, person-centered, or any other major school of psychotherapy is not merely a choice of a set of tools pulled out of Mary Poppins' carpet bag. It's about the adoption of a philosophy of life, a way of being in the world. This is why the various schools are protective of their body of knowledge and insist on lengthy and intense apprenticeships. Remember that person-centred therapy is part of the humanistic school, so there is an overarching assumption that its practitioners need to believe strongly in its fundamental philosophy, the concept of self-actualisation. Indeed, it has to be one of their personal values. Self-actualization has two dimensions in person-centered therapy. Firstly, the counsellor has to believe in the incredible potential of their client. And secondly, the client has to believe in their own incredible potential. Maslow defined self-actualization as a desire to become everything that one is capable of becoming. Self-actualization doesn't say what you should be or how you should get to be it but it does say that you should be motivated to achieve your most demanding personal development ambitions. Exactly what these will be is highly individual. The point is that we have to believe that they are attainable and be striving for them. According to Maslow, before you can be considered to be self-actualizing, your fundamental human needs to belong and to have self-esteem should have been met. In his opinion, self-actualization rarely happens, certainly in less than 1% of the adult population. The fact that most of us function most of the time on a level lower than that of self-actualization, he called the psychopathology of normality. Normality, because it's the commonest state of being. Psychopathology, because it is a suboptimal state in which our own psychology is keeping us. Carl Rogers' interpretation of this was that self-actualization occurs when a person's ideal self, in other words, who they would like to be, is congruent with their actual behavior, their self-image. When someone achieves this, Rogers considered them to be a fully functioning person. We're going to pause for thought or for discussion for a few minutes. I'd like you to have a go at drawing up a quick summary at this stage. Then answer these questions. What is the relationship between the practice of counselling skills and an underlying philosophy of life? To practice as a therapist in the person-centred approach, we have to believe in the potential for self-actualisation for everyone. Consider how you feel about this. What situations and what sorts of people might compromise this for you? And finally, there's a subtle difference between the use of the idea of self-actualization by Maslow and Rogers. How do you see this? How would you describe it? Rogers described five characteristics of this fully functioning person. He said that firstly, they had to be open to experience. Both positive and negative emotions are accepted and negative ones are worked through. Secondly, existential living. Whatever they're doing, they live for the moment and they fully appreciate the present. They avoid prejudgment and preconceptions and they're not always looking back to the past or forward to the future. Thirdly, they trust their feelings. They pay attention to their feelings, to their instincts and their gut reactions, and they trust themselves to make the right choices in their life by using these. Fourthly, creativity. They think creatively and they take risks. 
they don't play safe all the time. They adjust, they change and they seek new experiences. And finally, they live a fulfilled life. While they're happy and satisfied with their life, they are also always looking for new challenges and experiences. In combination, this makes for people who are well adjusted, well balanced and interesting to know. These then are the outcomes that the person-centred therapist is expecting to work towards with their clients. Some people pick up a mistaken idea that person-centred therapy is entirely without direction, that it randomly trawls through anything that the client brings to their sessions. Nothing could be further from the truth. The therapist is constantly looking for ways to support the client to step towards self-actualization by becoming fully functioning and in particular to live their life in those five characteristic ways. So I'm going to ask you to pause for thought or discussion a second time. Add a few more notes to your summary and then consider the following scenario and think about what kinds of questions you might explore with the client, given what Rogers is suggesting are the characteristics of a fully functioning person. Let's describe a client. Madge has been married for 12 years and she has two children. There's nothing specifically wrong with her life. She has a demanding job which she enjoys and she gets good feedback about. She enjoys time with the children, watching them develop and stretch themselves. She's always there for her husband when he needs her support. She doesn't get much time for herself and is generally quite glad to get to bed. Sex is a struggle, a cuddle and a fumble on some Saturday nights. Their social life revolves around the family and school. She had a 15 year reunion with some college friends last month. They stayed in a hotel near their old campus, had supper, got slightly drunk and some went off to a club, but Madge and three friends headed back to the hotel and settled down in one of their rooms, chatting for hours with cups of herbal tea. It was just like being back at college. We reminisced a lot and I began to realise how much I missed the freedom we had then. We opened up to one another more than I do to anyone these days. We all have different lives and there were some striking differences, but we all had something, well, something missing. Different things, materially, but maybe they were all connected in some way. So how can people change when they experience therapy? Most therapeutic approaches have their own theory of change. Carl Rogers' hypothesis was that for constructive personality change to occur, it is necessary that six conditions exist and continue over a period of time. The conditions are, number one, psychological contact between the client and the counsellor. Number two, the client is incongruent, usually expressed through their anxiety or psychological vulnerability. Number three, the counsellor is congruent. Number four, the client receives empathy from the counsellor. Number five, the counsellor shows unconditional positive regard towards the client. And number six, the client perceives acceptance and unconditional positive regard from the counsellor. The three popular ones are congruence, empathy and unconditional positive regard, though many people miss the subtlety of the rest of the words and the others are actually just as important. In the next three sections, I'm going to look at these three in more depth. Humanists, including Rogers, speak of self-image, how we see ourselves at the moment, the ideal self, how we would like to be, and self-worth, how we feel about ourselves. All three of those change through time. However, self-worth is strongly influenced by the ways in which our primary carers, as a young child, related to us. When there's a difference between our ideal self and our self-image, we are incongruent. 
most of us are this to some extent overall and in relation to specific dimensions of life. But in extremis, someone will be anxious and or psychologically vulnerable. And Rogerians believe that it is important for the client to be experiencing anxiety or vulnerability for them to change their personality. We know a lot more about empathy than was known at the time of Rogers and Maslow's writing. Empathy is a process of communication that depends on our capacity to correctly experience the same emotional responses as someone else does, but without having the same trigger event. This distinguishes it from sympathy and compassion. Empathy originates in a particular type of neuron in the brain known as spindle cells, which develop their functionality in the first four years of life. Empathy begins with the way in which one person exudes their emotions through tiny changes in their face and neck muscles and blood flow. Someone else using their empathy can receive it. Someone who is more highly empathic is particularly good at receiving the emotions of other people and correctly identifying them. Under normal circumstances, empathy is a largely unconscious process. As therapists, we slowly try to develop our ability to look for our own empathic responses and bring them into our consciousness so that we can interpret them and respond consciously as well as empathically to our clients. Empathy is actually experienced in three ways, somatic through physical feelings, cognitive through thoughts which prompt sympathy, and affective or purely emotional, which is at the heart of Rogerian therapy. In the Rogerian model, therapists work hard to develop their own affective empathy because they're able to experience what the client is also experiencing, but may not be aware of, the therapist can then have to spend some time helping the client to develop their own empathy and only then may personality change be possible. The way in which a child's sense of self-worth is developed is through their primary carers giving them unconditional positive regard. Once we get older, there will be other significant people who will strongly influence our self-worth too. Unconditional positive regard means that the message is given to the child or adult later. Tell it that it is accepted and loved regardless of what it does, and especially if it does something wrong or makes a mistake. There are no strings attached to unconditional positive regard. The ability to convey unconditional positive regard by demonstrating zero judgment, total interest and appropriate exclusivity are skills that an experienced counsellor will be using throughout their sessions with a client. If they challenge inappropriately, if they seem bored, if they become distracted or they fail in their empathy, then the client won't perceive the state of unconditional positive regard. Demonstrating conditional positive regard is worse if the message the client receives is that they are only valued when they are able to satisfy the counsellor, for example by having exciting symptoms, vividly recalled dreams or juicy anecdotes, then their sense of self-worth will be eroded. Some clients are preconditioned to have to entertain and their therapist will be carefully managing how they respond to this and to the moments when they are not being entertained. This might encourage the client to adopt a more reflective space, but without demeaning the entertainment. So now for a few words of caution. One of the pivotal papers of the humanistic psychotherapy school, of which person-centred therapy is a part, was Abraham Maslow's 1943 article on a theory of human motivation, which must surely be crucial reading for person-centred counsellors. In it, Maslow puts forward his argument for self-actualization as the fundamental desire for human beings. He makes it clear that his theory is just that, a set of premises on which further research needs to be conducted although he gives the impression that it is a fairly rigid hierarchy of needs. 
In practice, it is much more fluid and there are plenty of exceptions. When you read the paper, you may find some of it disturbing. Although slavery became illegal in the United States in 1865, while discussing the need for self-esteem, Maslow questions whether the desire for independence and freedom is universal. And he suggests that we don't yet know whether men who are enslaved and dominated will inevitably feel dissatisfied and rebellious. While the rest of us, quotes, will not willingly or easily allow our freedom to be taken away from us, he suggests that, again quotes, we do not know if this is true for the person born into slavery. By doing so, he was effectively providing a theoretical justification for the ongoing economic slavery of African Americans. Among the exceptions that his argument conveniently ignores are the ascetic religious lifestyles that exceptional creative artists often live in penniless situations and the severe economic hardship that was being experienced by what we would describe as working class Americans in the early 1940s. As America joined the Allied war effort, unemployment fell dramatically. However, pay rates were extremely low, working conditions declined and hours rose significantly. Those who couldn't find work could enlist, but military wages were typically two thirds those of an unskilled labourer. Maslow's ideas, therefore, could perhaps have been better described as a theory of motivation for the affluent middle class. I'll provide some links in the further reading section for you to follow up on some of these issues.